tonight in OZK 150, we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about modernization issues of, of uh, the modernizing world coming to the Ozarks, for the most part in the 19th century, but we'll also get into the 20th century. And there are any number of things we could talk about that have to do with modernization. Most of what we'll talk about tonight are the sort of material signs of modernization uh, as they have to do with transportation, getting people in and out of the Ozarks and around inside the Ozarks. So we'll talk about railroads, talk about highway building, stuff like that. And we'll talk about the coming of industry to the Ozarks. So most of what we talk about tonight will be historical. Uh, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time in the 19th century and uh, look at ways that the Ozarks developed beyond just that, that image that we often have of the region as a place of small farms, sort of backward little communities with grist mills and, and things like that. Before we get there, though, we'll take a look at our famous Ozarker. Since we're competing with Bob Dylan tonight. That's not Bob Dylan, but it is a guy with a guitar. And uh, unlike a lot of the quote-unquote famous Ozarkers that we've met this semester, uh, this guy is somewhat famous, though uh, you've, you've heard him even if you don't know who he is because you've heard his guitar playing on songs. Or you, if you listen to much stuff from the 60s and 70s, you probably heard his guitar playing on, on music. Anybody have a clue who that is? This is Steve Cropper. And he's the skinny white guy in the picture. If you didn't know which one he is in there. Uh, Steve Cropper one of the most famous rhythm and blues guitarists in America. And he was a member of the house band at Stax Records. And the house band was known as Booker T and the MGs. And uh, the more mature amongst us remember uh, Booker T and the MGs, or you've heard of Booker T and the, and the MGs. And... Uh, he, was, he was their uh, guitarist. He was born in Dora, Missouri. Does anybody know where Dora is? You know where Dora is? Did you really? On your, on your road trip? You road tripped in Dora. There you go. Dora is in, uh, it's in Ozark County. It's in the kind of northeastern corner of Ozark County. It's actually... Uh, kind of, kind of between Ava and West Plains, that area. Though not exactly, you got to get off the highway to get to Dora. But he was born, partially raised there, and when he was nine years old, his family moved to Memphis, and so he went from Ozark boy to Memphis boy. I'm sure that was quite an adjustment, uh, but uh, it led to his career in Memphis, and he later, if, you, if you've seen the movie Blues Brothers, the John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd movie, he was uh, the guitarist in the Blues Brothers band and played with Levon Helm in, in a band at one time. Levon Helm just died, I think, last year, if you remember him, the drummer uh, from the band, the band called the band, speaking of Dylan, yeah. Uh, with connections uh, to Dylan there. So, uh, Cropper, quite a successful guy. Considered one of the, the great guitarists. Well, there was one a British magazine that a few years ago named him the greatest living guitarist. That'd be something. And the fact that they had to say greatest living guitarist, I guess suggests that guitars tend to die young, you know. And, but uh, our word for the day is Annie Goglin. Annie 
antigogs. I'm sure most of you have used that word probably today. Antigoglin. Or maybe you haven't. I don't know. Does anybody know what antigoglin means? The opposite of goglin? Yeah? I guess it does. I, uh, what do you think goglin means? That's, that's the tough one, isn't it? <laughs> Anybody know Annie Goglin? It means crooked or out of line. If something is Annie Goglin, you know, if, you, if you're a bad civil engineer, you may build an Annie Goglin road. And we have an agricultural reference here. Somebody who made his windrows Annie Goglin. We've talked about windrows, haven't we? In here. We haven't talked about what a windrow is in here. I guess that seems fresh on my mind, but I guess that was last, last spring when we did. Who knows what a windrow is? Well, it's uh, it more uh, harvest when you're harvesting crops, uh, the lines. In this case, what he's talking about is a, a windrow of hay. Yeah, when you, when you cut hay and then you rake it up into, into these nice rows so you can come along and bale it, that's what a windrow is. Yeah. So if you were, if you were drunk <laughs> while you're raking hay, it might be a little harder to you know, keep your windrow straight. Keep them from being anti goglin. Yeah. So it does mean, like, we, when we speak of out of line, we mean off base. Yeah, n not, n not like you're acting up. Yeah, yeah. Not that kind of out of line. Out of, you know, that. All right. So there you go. Your, your new word, find some use for it. And as you'll, as you'll notice, if you haven't done your road trip yet, Ozark's roads are notoriously Annie Goglin. You know, they are some of those where you can, you can see your taillights, you know, as you, as you round the corners and stuff like that. So let's talk about some modernizing elements that have affected Ozark's history. And... As we talk about over and over in here, these are things that obviously are not unique to the Ozarks. Railroads affected everywhere in the 19th century, everywhere they went in the 19th century. Industry affected places, rural areas, cities in the 19th century. But we're going to look at the way these, these places affected the Ozarks, some of the lingering effects of these modernizing influences. And again, we're just looking at a, just a few, just to get an idea of what we're talking about with modernization. Now we know that the overwhelming majority of the early settlers, the pre-Civil War settlers, and for that matter, most of the post-Civil War settlers in the, in the Ozarks in the 19th century were agricultural. They settled on farms or settled in areas and, and hunted and trapped and, and things like that. And it was only on the eve of the Civil War when the modern world in, in the form of the railroad came to the Ozarks. In the 19th century, the railroad was the ultimate symbol of modernity. If you had the railroad, then you, know, you were connected to the rest of America. That was the great, the great vein of transportation, and that was uh, what, in many ways, fueled the economy in the 19th century, was rail, rail, the railroad and railroad building. And it's only on the eve of the Civil War that the railroad comes to the Ozarks. It comes down from St. Louis into the northeastern part of the Ozarks, St. Louis certainly being the, the biggest city uh, the, the one metropolitan area that Missouri had at the time, and it's much of Missouri's source of wealth and prosperity and modernization, all that kind of stuff. 
So the railroad comes down the St. Louis and Iron Mountain, reaches the town of Pilot Knob in 1858, and it goes no farther south until after the Civil War. Certainly the war interrupts all kinds of things, including the building of railroads. But it comes down to Pilot Knob, and as a result of that, Pilot Knob becomes an important place during the Civil War. Uh, lots of armies want to hang out around Pilot Knob because they, they have access to the, to the railroad, and there are skirmishes there, and uh, lots of action going on, lots of troops in and out of Pilot Knob. And uh, a separate line comes all the way down to Rolla on the eve of the Civil War. And that's the same railroad line that will eventually make its way after the war down here to Springfield. And uh, so you got, at the, when the Civil War starts in 1861, you've got two railroad lines coming into the northern part of the Ozarks, just starting to introduce the region to this, uh, to this modern contraption, the railroad, starting to link the region with the rest of the, the country. Now, that's not to say that other places in the Ozarks, that the, the vast number of places that had no connection to the railroad in 1861 were completely cut off from the rest of the country and were backward and were, uh, were pre-modern or anything like that. Uh, we'll get into, into that a little bit later. Uh, it just means that the most modern of these changes of the 19th century had only reached uh, a very limited number of people in the Ozarks uh, by 1861. And as was the case with railroads across the country, railroad companies didn't just take off and start building tracks into rural areas. They had to have some reason, some justification for doing so. They had to have something in an area that they thought would make them money by transporting goods out of a region by transporting stuff back into a region. And usually in the 19th century, their targeted resources were timber and minerals. And the Ozarks had both of those. In the northeastern part of the Ozarks, in the Pilot Knob area, you're talking about uh, the vicinity of, uh, in the immediate Pilot Knob area, you've got iron deposits and those would be developed later in the 19th century. Uh, that area is also in the vicinity of the Great Lead Belt, and the railroad actually comes through part of the, the lead belt up there. So you've got lead, iron, that the railroads are interested in, in shipping out, making money, transporting it. After the Civil War, these railroads will penetrate into the Great Pine Forests, of southeast Missouri and will make a lot of money transporting timber and finished lumber. And that's what also was leading them down into southwest Missouri as well. Eventually, uh, in, the, uh, in the years before the Civil War, as we'll see in the minute, mining had started to develop in far southwest Missouri in a little place called Granby. And uh, the railroads were eventually heading that direction to try to get down to those uh, zinc and, and iron mines that were down in the Granby area and, and for lead mining as well. But this is what attracted railroad companies. As I mentioned, the, the Civil War, the four years of war, disrupts all railroad building, most building of any kind that didn't have to do with a war effort. But soon after the war ends in 1865, things eventually get to rolling again. The railroad companies start building again. And in 1870, uh, the renamed Atlantic and Pacific Railroad, uh, which would a few years later be renamed uh, the St. Louis and, and San Francisco Railroad, it's popularly known as the Frisco Railroad, would make its way to Springfield and then would build on past Springfield down to Pierce City, eventually building down to Neosho and then on into Oklahoma. 
it was meant to be uh, a railroad that would stretch to the Pacific, thus the name, Atlantic and Pacific. And uh, this railroad, for the most part, the, the railroad is still there, and it's the one that pretty much follows Highway 60. If you head west of Springfield out Highway 60, a lot of the times there's a railroad right there next to the highway. Sometimes they're not in the same path, but for much of the way, they're in the same path. And that's basically the trail uh, that becomes Highway 60. And this is what uh, helps turn Springfield into a railroad town. On the other side of the Ozarks, at the same time, the Iron Mountain Railroad starts building south from Pilot Knob down into the, into the pine forests to exploit this, these huge uh, stands of virgin pine, some of the great virgin pine forests of the, the late 1800s in the United States. Uh, it builds all the way down to Poplar Bluff and, and all kinds of little uh, branch lines are built off of this railroad into the forests. And railroads build towns wherever they go. As the railroad spreads out, at least every five miles, a new town pops up uh, with a depot and, and any sort of amenities uh, that, that traveling people need and also that local people need. Towns pop up along these, whether it's Highway 60 out that way or what's now, uh, I-44, that pretty much follows the, the line of the railroad that came down from Rolla to Springfield. US-60 out east of Springfield. You know, all these places, it's not that they necessarily always built the highways and the railroads together, but these were old trails. They were well-traveled roads that were not only good for railroad building, but they were later good for highway building. And that's why you often get the situation in the Ozarks where highways and railroads are together. They, they travel those old well-traveled roads and, and paths that were here before railroads. So you get lots of railroad towns that spring up. And then over in the Joplin area, when that town booms, in the 1870s, you get the introduction of the railroad there. Obviously, the railroad companies are there to take advantage of the mining boom in the Joplin area. And we'll talk a little more about mining in a little bit, specifically with Joplin. So you can see gradually, these places are getting connected. Now, as we'll see when we look at a map, we're leaving huge chunks of the Ozarks that aren't served by railroads. And a lot of the Ozarks remains rather remote when you look at their ability to travel and communicate with the rest of the country. Springfield, as I mentioned, became a, a major railroad town. It becomes largely because so many railroads intersect in Springfield. And we've just mentioned the one so far, uh, but eventually you get a second major railroad, the Kansas City Fort Scott in Memphis, that comes in uh, obviously from Kansas City, Fort Scott, Kansas, into Springfield and, and then builds on to Memphis. And that's the, the railroad that builds out east of town and follows Highway 60 east of town. And because of these railroads crossing in Springfield, you get uh, a major railroad town so that by the late 1800s, early 1900s, the railroad industry is the primary industry of Springfield. It employs more people than anything else, and it's really what makes Springfield go is all of this rail traffic. Uh, Ashgrove is an example of just one of numerous railroad towns that, uh, that boom in the late 1800s and early 1900s with all the, the rail traffic and, and all the, the commerce that's generated because people from all over the countryside bring things to sell and to ship out 
on the railroads. And so these towns become busy little places. Even uh, places today uh, like, uh, like Sparta and Chadwick and little towns today that aren't on the railroad, back in the days when they had branch railroads leading everywhere, those were very busy places. And today you go, you drive through those places and there's nothing going on. There's barely a, a store there and you know, a little bitty school or something. But back in the day, late 1800s, early 1900s, these were booming places with people bringing in railroad ties and cattle and hogs and different things to ship out on the rails, lots of timber and, and lumber. Uh, so there, of course, Ash Grove is a good example of these. The, so far we've mainly talked about Missouri. The Arkansas Ozarks get railroad service later than Missouri because the railroads in the Arkansas Ozarks tend to come out of Missouri. And both, uh, you get in the 1880s, a railroad that's built into extreme northwestern Arkansas down to Fayetteville, that area. And you get one that's built into the northeastern part of the Arkansas Ozarks, uh, the Kansas City, Fort Scott, and Memphis. As it goes to Memphis, it goes through the, uh, the Arkansas Ozarks down, it goes through West Plains and then heads down into Arkansas from there. And uh, so much of Arkansas is, by the time the 1900s roll around, much of Arkansas is still without railroad service, much of the Arkansas Ozarks. Here's our Missouri Railroad map. This is uh, from the year 1888. So we're going back a little ways. What, what jumps out at you about this map as you look at it, as it has to do with the Ozarks? Well, okay, we're, here's Greene County right here. You can see this, is that, is that this is Springfield right here. Yeah. Are those red lines railroads? Yeah. These, uh, well, all these, all these thick lines are railroads. Some of them are blue, some of them are red. If we had a, if that was a clearer map, uh, somehow they're color coordinated by the company, by the rail line on there. Where's Kansas City? Kansas City is up here. Of course. Uh, that's one of the things that you notice is that. Right. And there's 13 going up right. This, is, this railroad is, is roughly what I-44 is today. You've got uh, I-60 heading out this way. Uh, not I-60, US-60. US-60 coming out this way. Um, you don't really, eh, 63 down through here. I'm not sure. That's, that's something you notice uh, immediately is that the northern part of Missouri, uh, which tends to be more fertile, more productive agriculturally, has a whole lot more rail service. If you live somewhere in northern Missouri, you're more than likely you're going to live within a day's wagon ride of a railroad somewhere because there's so many of them. Down in here, there are big swaths of the Ozarks, and we're not even looking at the Arkansas Ozarks, uh, which had almost no railroads in 1888. There are big swaths of the Ozarks down here where you could live a whole long ways from the railroad, and the railroad really wouldn't be a factor in your life at all, or not that you could tell. Like this one? No, farther to the northwest. Oh, yeah, oh this? Yeah, like that one. Yeah. That's just, that's just as far as they had been built in 1888. Uh, they, they may have, the companies may have continued to build them after the map was made, or they, they may have just built them to a specific place and said, this is as far as we want to go. I don't really know. I mean, that, that happened a lot. Sometimes... Lines got built to places 
Uh, well, Ava had a, had a railroad at one time, and it was a, uh, I'm not sure, some of this is hard, uh, that it was just built off of the main line of the railroad down to, to Ava for a number of years, and then, you know, eventually they said, well, this is not making us any money, let's just take up this track and not mess with this. Yeah, that, that railroad... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it, it was taken up a long time ago. But some of these like this one uh which comes down here, I'm not sure. It could just be timing. Uh Willard. Willard is going to be out here somewhere. But there was a railroad there. Yeah. Well, there're just there are in the Springfield area, there are all kinds of little, uh, you got main lines and you've got branch lines that go all over the place. As I mentioned earlier, you can see this line here that's no longer there that, that goes all the way down to Chadwick in Christian County. And so you had lots of these. Here's another line that goes up here to Polk County. Uh, and... And the map, is, it's a little bit hard to tell in some cases what's a creek and what's a railroad on that map but because it, you know, they, they put all the creeks and rivers and stuff on there too. But, but that's a, uh, that is a good point that it's obvious that there weren't as many railroad lines in the Ozarks as there were in the rest of Missouri. And a lot of that had to do with terrain it was harder to build railroads. It was more expensive to build railroads in the Ozarks because you had to go over or through hills and hollers and over you had to build bridges all the time over these streams. And, you know, it's an expensive endeavor to, to grade these roads and, and, and put all that stuff in there. And it's also, Many places in the Ozarks, it's not necessarily a paying endeavor for railroad companies. They, a railroad company could build a railroad out into the middle of Texas County or down into Ozark County, but why would they? As I said, they don't build railroads in places where they don't think they're going to make money by being able to ship something, carry something. And in some of these places where agriculture is not all that great, where, you know, there's, there's not, there, there aren't minerals somewhere under the ground. You know, there's just not, not really any reason to build a railroad into these places. You know, unless a railroad's just building through on its way to somewhere else, like it was when they built from Springfield down here or, or down into there, you know. And there are some places that just, happen to get on the rail line because they're in the right place. They're in the place where the railroads are going to be building through on their way from somewhere to somewhere else. But uh, they, um, drain, southeast Missouri? drain southeast Missouri? Yeah. Uh, for the most part, I believe in the early 20th century. I'm sure they did probably some in the late 1800s, but, uh, but they did a lot of draining in the early 20th century, setting up levy districts and collecting tax money to, to build all those levies and yeah. You know. But you can see here, even in southeast Missouri, you've got several railroad lines running around, but that was cotton country or beginning to be cotton country, and there there, you know, was some wealth down there even in those early days before they drained parts of it. These large trunk line railroads, the, the big railroads that were going from somewhere to somewhere else and came through the Ozarks, as I mentioned, they spawned all kinds of little branch railroads. And a lot of times the branch railroads would last for a decade or two decades, uh, however long it took to extract whatever they were extracting from wherever they were extracting it. So. In northwest Arkansas, you had a lot of these little branch railroads that ran out into the forests. 
in northwest Arkansas, it wasn't pine timber as much as it was hardwood timber, white oak timber, red oak, that kind of stuff. And once the timber was cut out, there was no reason to have the railroads anymore, and they would usually just take up the lines. You know, they'd leave them dormant for a couple of years and then just take the line up, yeah, pull the rails and, and everything. And there are some places in the Ozarks today where uh, counties or towns have tried to use the old railroad beds that where you can still see like a raised graded area where the railroad once was and they, they use them for bike paths or walking trails and, and stuff like that. And so there are lots of, lots of instances like the Katy Trail and, and things like that. But uh, you got these, uh, these branch lines all around the Ozarks. In Arkansas, though, the interior part of the Ozarks remained free from the influence of the railroad until the early 20th century when uh, two lines are finally built through the region. Just a few pictures, railroad pictures. Ra there are thousands of railroad pictures. It's one of the things people took pictures of back in those days. You go ride the rails and you take pictures of yourself. Here's an 1899 railroad map in Arkansas. And this one's a little harder to see, but you can tell, even, even though it's a little fuzzy, that that whole northern section of Arkansas is free from railroads. They're just beginning uh, to be built into, you can see one up there uh, that's kind of snaking over from the west into uh, like Carroll County and Boone County. And that railroad will eventually be finished in the early 1900s. But you can see there by the turn of the century, there was still a huge section of the Arkansas, most of the Arkansas Ozarks didn't have railroad service or lived a long ways from railroad service. But again, you get that same kind of feeling. You look there and you think, yeah, not really building railroads in the Ozarks all that much. You know, they certainly hadn't by 1899. All right, again, uh, mineral deposits, timber. But as the railroads built through places, they generated their own commerce, their own their own business uh, by town building. Wherever you had the railroad, it impacted local agriculture. It impacted what people grew and how much of it they grew. All of a sudden, if you lived somewhere in, in Wright County, which is a couple counties over to the east, and in the 1880s, all of a sudden the railroad comes through, the Kansas City, Fort Scott, and Memphis Railroad comes through, then you've got immediate access to railroad transportation that you didn't have just a year before. That might impact what you decide to, to grow if you're a farmer. Because now, here's, here's easy shipping. You know? And so what you saw along these railroad lines is a lot of times farmers would take up uh, the growing of, of fruit, Apples and peaches became very popular as the railroads came through because these are, are perishable crops that you have to be able to get to market pretty quickly. And if you've got railroad service, you can do that. You would even have the beginnings of the dairy industry in places where farmers 40, 50 miles outside of Springfield could ship, uh, could ship cream and dairy products, butter or, or even you know, eggs or other kinds of things. Uh, eggs aren't dairy products, obviously, but those kinds of agricultural products, you could ship those to a company in Springfield that, that specialized in, in uh, marketing those things or processing them. So all kinds of opportunities opened up for agricultural change when the railroad came in. Uh, opportunities opened up in all these small towns and all these little railroad towns. Every if you drive out uh, Highway 60 east of here today, say if you're, if you're going out toward, uh, if you drive from here to West Plains and you go by all those little towns uh, 
from Springfield, you go through Rogersville and Fordland and Seymour and all those. Those are all railroad towns. Those are all places that ex exist solely because the railroad was built through there, and they were little towns that popped up basically every five miles down the railroad. They would have a depot and have a hardware store, a dry goods store, a couple groceries, newspaper. You know, that was, these were your classic American railroad small towns. Some of them became bigger than, than others did, uh, and most of them today are in the process of kind of slowly drying up, uh, especially now that uh, in, on I-44 and on US-60, as we've built bypasses and all that kind of stuff, nobody goes through these towns anymore. You know, you rarely stop in these towns. But uh, at one time, uh, they were booming places because of the railroad. And they attracted people from across the country to these places. You know, it's no, no surprise that of all the places in the Ozarks that the Wilders end up. We know we've met Laura Ingalls Wilder earlier in the semester and her husband Almanzo, uh, you know, made famous by the Little House books. Uh, they end up in Mansfield and it was on the railroad. They end up in Mansfield not long after the railroad is built through Mansfield and you know, they didn't end up in Dora, Missouri. They didn't end up, they ended up somewhere that they could get to, hop off the railroad, and they're there. And these railroad companies marketed land uh, around the United States to, to people who, who often bought this land sight unseen and just showed up. Sometimes to people who were in the United States, sometimes to foreigners, people who wanted to come over and start life in America, and you had all these little colonies pop up along railroads. But in the eastern Ozarks, uh, the town of Piedmont was a good example of a place that really, for the most part, didn't exist before the railroad came through, uh, or was just a little, you know, you know, a little crossroads village type place. And the railroad comes through the Iron Mountain in 1871, and by 1880, there are 700 people living in Piedmont, and it's got all kinds of businesses and hotels and, and all that kind of stuff. Seven, you think, well, 700 people, that's, you know, there's probably 700 people in this building uh, tonight, if, if not more than that. But in those days, you know, a town of 700 people, that was pretty substantial. And if you're talking about going from a crossroads hamlet of two or three families to a town of 700 people, that's... That's quite, quite a bit of growth. And a lot of these people are people who came in from other places, sometimes from other states, drawn in by the railroad and the, and the commercial possibilities that the railroad promised. How did these railroads decide where they were going to go? Did they buy the land? Were they given the land? Did they go anywhere they wanted? Uh, they, well, there were, there were different laws that were passed, a lot of times state, the states would uh, charter these railroads and they would grant them land along uh, the, the path that they had decided to follow. Sometimes uh, railroads would request land from landowners and, and a lot of times landowners would just, you know, voluntarily give up the land along the, the proposed right-of-way of a railroad because the landowners were thinking if the railroad comes through, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting pretty. I'm right here on the railroad, and my, land's, my land value is going to skyrocket if I decide to sell it, or certainly I'll have more access to shipping and all that kind of stuff. And so a lot of people voluntarily just said, okay, here's, not, not that they gave them, Okay, here's my 280-acre farm. You can have it. But the land along, along the proposed right-of-way, uh, the railroad companies uh, ended up with this land, either you know, by the states granting, the, granting it to them or by people giving it to them. In some cases, I'm sure they, they probably bought it, but usually railroad companies were, you know, were able to, to get thousands of acres of land in other ways. And then one of the ways that 
they could make their money was by selling land along the railroads for these colonies and or you know housing what we would call you know housing developments and stuff like that. Is that the way the transcontinental railroad was? They were given a lot of land and they would sell it off. Right. In that case, what they were doing was building a railroad across uh, that a land that hadn't been sold yet. I mean, it was still in the federal. It was still in federal hands. That land was a lot of this land where these railroads are building would have been privately owned by this time, well, already would have been uh, farmland. And uh, so you had all the, lots of these little railroad towns that spring up for one reason or another. Some are still around, some are not. Clearwater doesn't exist anymore. It was uh, on the same, it was uh, on the river near the railroad in the southeastern Ozarks. And as I've already mentioned, the railroad spurred farming and often changed the style of farming in, in certain areas so that much of the Ozarks in the late 1800s and early 1900s becomes known for its fruit production, the land of the big red apple, that, that sort of uh, reputation the Ozarks had. Northwest Arkansas by the early 1900s, uh, Benton County, which is where Bentonville is, and Washington County, where Fayetteville is, just produced prodigious amounts of apples, fruit, and the same was the case with a lot of southwest and south-central Missouri counties. So in all of these ways, the, the railroad helped modernize the region uh, agriculturally in terms of commerce, getting people even more people directly involved in the markets. Uh, Piedmont, that's where Piedmont is in, in Wayne County. You know, most of us, our, our guy who was from that area is not here tonight. All right, and I mentioned in the, in the first decade of the 20th century, two new railroads were built through the heart of the Arkansas Ozarks. And it's a little hard to to see what kind of what sticks out at you are the red things, and those are actually highways. Uh, but if you can see here, uh, this is a railroad that, for the most part, follows uh, the White River. That's one of the railroads that was built. And there's another railroad uh, down here. If you can see that line, when you pull these up, when you pull this up on blackboard uh, the the powerpoint show you should be able to see the lines a little better but here's another railroad uh, that that came down through here oh yeah where yeah yeah this is uh here's saint james right here yeah you remember saint james from uh ghost of the ozarks yeah, it's right here. So here's, here's White River, St. James, just a few miles from the river. And that's where. And where's your home? Where's my home? Uh, I, it's, it's not on there, but uh, we, we can't even make it on a, like a 100-year-old map. But uh, yeah, I, I grew up right, right around in here, yeah, close to the Strawberry River. Yeah. So, well, it is on here. I was looking at, yeah, it's, it's underneath. Uh, this is it right here, Violet Hill. Yeah, but I actually grew up uh, about three miles north of, north of the big community of Violet Hill. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, closer to Strawberry River. The railroad line that follows the White River is still there. It's the, it, that one is still there. Uh, this one is not. This one was taken up back in the 40s or the 50s. Uh, this one is called the Missouri and North Arkansas line. Yeah, that this one, uh, and well, pretty much all of the Ozarks railroads were were organ, were uh, advertised in the late 1800s and early 1900s to tourists, especially people from Kansas City and St. Louis, come and and see the scenery. Uh, but certainly, the uh, this one. Uh, which eventually 
becomes the Missouri Pacific. The, the Missouri Pacific eventually owns this line, and, uh, and it was advertised extensively because it's the same line that goes through Branson. That's the same railroad line uh, that, that goes through Branson and then on, and basically just follows White River. You know, Branson's on the river, and uh, for the most part, that, that line just follows White River on down to Batesville and then eventually out into the Delta region, you know. And then uh, this one, the Missouri and North Arkansas, they were both built about the same time. You can see they're not that far apart. They kind of parallel each other, heading from northwest to southeast. And, uh, and the Missouri and North Arkansas line was never very profitable and uh, had the reputation for being undependable. M uh, MNA was the, the initials, Missouri, North Arkansas, and a lot of people joked that it stood for may never arrive. Uh, so that, but uh, that was, you know, and so it wasn't a surprise that after World War II, that one went out of business and they took the tracks up and, and you can see very little trace of that railroad today. But again, it goes through a very beautiful uh, uh, area today. But as you can see, my, my home community wasn't on the railroad. We were, we were safely away from the railroad. Now here's, a, and here's the older railroad up here. That's the, the one that uh, Kansas City, uh, Fort Scott, and Memphis, the one that comes through Springfield and goes out east and goes through Willow Springs and down through West Plains and Thayer and down that way. Uh, and it, as I mentioned, it skirted the northeastern part of the Arkansas Ozarks. And Millie, I think you were, were you talking about Hardy once? Visiting Hardy, was that you? No. Okay, that was somebody else in, uh, in another class, I guess, talking about. But there's, there's Hardy up there. All right. But I like that map. It's, it's uh, got nice colors on it. Okay, let's, we'll talk a little bit about mining. Uh, that was, as we mentioned, that was one of the things that, that promoted railroad building into the Ozarks. And it was one of the things that helped modernize areas of the Ozarks. Mining was obviously a localized thing in the Ozarks. There are vast reaches of the Ozarks where mining really never took hold, either because you have no minerals or because they're there in such, uh, such small supply or because they're so hard to get at that mining just never developed in places. But in the Ozarks, you had three main regions. You had the, the lead belt of the eastern Ozarks, sometimes referred to as the mineral area. And nowadays we re refer to it as the old lead belt because there's a new lead belt where they currently mine lead. And uh, it's, it's a, a new vein of lead that they discovered about 50 years ago, and that's where the, all the mining in that part of Missouri takes place now. You have the Tri-State District, that's the Joplin area, the greater Joplin area, and then the Arkansas District, uh, which wasn't as well developed as the, as the two districts in Missouri, but those were the three main mining areas in the Ozarks. And it was the Arkansas District of, uh, that, that helped attract the building of the Missouri and North Arkansas, the May Never Arrive line, was built through the, the Arkansas Mining <coughs> District. Now this is a map. Uh, this shows lots of other stuff. It, it makes it look like there was extensive mining in that area when really there was, it was really spotty and not nearly as profitable. Here's the main areas, the Tri-State, here's the Arkansas District, and then up in here you get the, uh, the old lead belt. Here's the new lead belt, and you can see on this map it actually says new lead belt. And the lead mining that still goes on in Missouri today is in that new lead belt. So if you do a, a road trip out that way, go to Salem and go back in the hills, east of Salem, 
you may get into the new lead belt where they, they actually do some, some lead mining today. Just a really quick history of mining in the Ozarks. The old lead belt in the northeastern part of the Ozarks, the, the major, the big time mining got underway shortly after the Civil War. There had been, we know there was, there was mining going all the way back into the 1700s when we talked about the French. One of the things that attracted them, and really the, the first thing that attracted them to that area of Missouri was the lead uh, that they mined. Uh, but the major lead mining only takes place after the Civil War. And there were certain mines and certain towns that grow up around these mines. Uh, Doe Run, Flat River, lots of these little mining towns. And in that area, uh, there's a town there uh, today called Park Hills. It's kind of right in the middle of the, of the mining area, that part of Missouri. And Park Hills is actually a consolidation of a lot of those old mining towns. There are like four or five towns that they consolidated into one city and called it Park Hills. And uh, for those towns in the old lead belt, uh, the mining has been shut down for the most part since the 1960s. And so, you know, they've, they've had to find other, other means of generating income for people up there. The St. Joseph Lead Company was at one time the world's largest lead company, and it was headquartered in that part of the, the Ozarks. And like mining companies around the United States, whether they were coal mining or copper mining or whatever they were mining, uh, by the early 1900s, it was very common for St. Joseph and these other lead companies to import cheap foreign labor. And so for a time in the early 1900s, you had large numbers of Eastern European miners, for, for example. And during World War I, there was a, a major outbreak of, of violence and potentially even worse violence against a lot of these Eastern European miners when, I think it was in 1917, when uh, several carloads of the Eastern European miners and their families were, were loaded up and were shipped out yeah, of the area. We talked about it when our grounds were full today. We had like a whole discussion one day that it was, they were actually Hungarian. And yeah. I mean, Heidi made it just to make it comical with the Hungarians who were basically like, oh, you guys are going to get shipped out to fight in war and we're going to take all your women. Right. <laughs> they didn't like it until we kind of, you that's, know, loaded them up at gunpoint on trains and shipped them out. Right, that's right. The, uh, the yeah, it was, uh, many of them were Hungarians and, uh, that's that's how the uh, the story goes. And there's been a little bit written about that that episode uh, that it did that it was sparked by sort of an offhanded comment. And I'm sure there yeah. there were probably issues between American-born miners and yeah. and your with with language and culture and religion and who knows you know what all went into that stew. Uh, but the the comment uh, apparently that one of them had made. Uh, as many of the American men were being drafted and, you know, getting ready to go off to fight in World War I was, uh, you guys go fight the war and we'll take care of your women. Actually, I think it was, uh, uh, we'll, we'll take care of your jobs and your women. Yeah. So I'm not sure which one insulted the, the American guys more, you know, losing their jobs or, or their women. But, uh, but that, uh, it actually resulted in violence and there was some rioting into the, part of town where uh, the Eastern European miners lived. And, and the end result was that most of them were unceremoniously shipped out of town. And uh, so... Isn't Bonterre the mine that's flooded that people could go down? Uh, yeah, yeah bon Terre has uh, the Missouri Mine Museum or whatever it's called. It's a, it's a state park. Uh, or not a, not a state park. It's it's a museum that you can that you can. Yeah, yeah. Park Hills has the state park, and Bon Terre has the has a privately operated museum. I believe that you can. Yeah, you can go underground. Yeah. Right. The the state park when they don't they don't do underground tours. I mean you can you can. You can look around. I'm sure there, there are all kinds of liability issues and stuff, and the state doesn't want to get into that. 
Uh, but you can go to the museum, and that's at, that's at Park Hills, I believe, where the State Park Museum, and then the one you're talking about is the, the underground actual tour thing. And just some pictures. Here's a picture of one of the mills of the St. Joseph Lead Company. And most of these pictures are from St. Francis County. Yeah, I think so. And that's where Park Hills is. Here's uh, the Doe Run Company. That was a big one. And that's uh, a company that's still over there in the, the lead belt, Doe Run. Uh, Sierra, that may be the town you were thinking. Elvins? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the little towns that went into the creation of Park Hills a few years ago when they, when they consolidated those towns. Uh, that's, that's another... <coughs> So lots of, lots of pictures of smog, you know, and smog producing smoke and smokestacks and all that kind of stuff. So it was a, you know, it was a really big deal. That was the economy in that part of Missouri for, for decades and decades. And I think, I think we'll go ahead and, and take us a quick break because we still got a, a little ways to go. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll finish our discussion of these modernizing influences.